Um, I just have a quick question. This is a Ruby conference and not a Rails conference, but I'm just curious. How many here um, have played with Rails? Right on. How many do Rails programming professionally? Right on. This is almost a Rails conference, right? Anyway. Um, we've been asked to do a, a live code review of a real Rails application. I'd like to thank Joel for giving this, uh, this application to look at. It's always kind of frightening to have a large body of people look over your code and have someone else go over it and point out what could be done better. We really appreciate that. Um, shall we just hop into it? Yeah. All right. So let's first pull up the community controller. To tell you the truth, we're not entirely sure what this application even does because we couldn't run it. We didn't have Postgres set up, so we couldn't do all that. Um, but so we're not looking at it from a this application should have been written this way in order to do what it needs to do better. We're just looking at it from this little snippet of code could probably be done differently um, to fit better with uh, Ruby and Rails idioms. <clears throat> One thing that struck us is this kind of pattern shows up a lot where um, something is assigned and then if not, the first nitpick is unless is a more Ruby-ish idiom. If you're saying instead of if not, you can say unless. Even better, though, since he's just checking to see if that current tab is null or not, you can say and get rid of that whole second line. Okay, that's that's the, the, the cleaner idiom that you see. Secondly, here he's checking to see if offset is nil. Um, and if it, if it isn't nil, he does a 2i on it. Otherwise, he sets it to 0. Fortunately, nil 2i is 0. So that cleans that one right up. Um, this one's a little hairier to, to pull into one line, and, and you don't always want to go for one-liners anyway. Ultimately, this, all of this should really be pulled into the get communities method on the, on the community controller. Um, so you'd, you'd assign all that. You'd just say, instead of, of a offset and so forth, you'd do params offset, params limit, um, params tab, and so forth. And then you would just let the communities method determine what to do in the case that it's nil or, or whatever. Yeah, there's a part in um, Ken Beck's small talk best practice patterns, many of you have read that, where he gives a tip on how you can approach refactoring uh, your methods and determine where to decompose methods, like what the dividing lines are. And his tip is that uh, method, all of the things that happen in a given method should be in the same level of abstraction. So in this case, we have the notion of communities get communities, which is like the higher level thing that's ultimately happening. And then we have all these little implementation details about how the community is going to be gotten, like setting the offset and the limit. And really, in the controller, all you want is the higher level symbolics of what's happening. So it's really just get communities. And you want to make the data available to that to determine what communities to get so that you're not mixing up those two things and kind of context switching between the lower level and the higher level concepts. Let's do a search on the. Yeah. Yeah. The difference. So does anybody know, except for Era, the difference between? So he was saying when we were saying instead of doing um, params offset or zero or whatever, if params offset was nil. Instead of doing 2i, like we were recommending, he would say do integer, which Jameis just wrote. So does anybody know what the difference between dot 2i and integer is? It's more strict. So how? Is it more strict? Basically, if you have, like, uh, if you go 2i and there's no strict notation, then it's still positive. Where integer will, uh, only do the strict If you do 2i on the string Marcel, it'll give you zero. But if you do integer on the string 2i, it'll raise an exception, right? So in cases where it really matters that you're expecting either nil or an integer and you get something like a string, if that matters, if that distinction matters, using integer is better because an exception will be raised rather than just getting zero. It's like the Perl approach. It, it, it probably depends on, on what it was. Like if you're... Um, he said, was that, so is, is that a choice that you would, is there Rails conventions for this, or wouldn't you just deal with that kind of domain logic in a different layer, in a different way? And I said it probably depends on what the business rules are, but yeah, I would, it wouldn't, I wouldn't probably just be doing 
coercion right there in the controller. It would be implemented over in the model in some different way. So ultimately, the story here is this would be refactored in an entirely different way, but given the way it is written, there are better ways of doing it. Yeah. It's actually more strict than that. Um, if you have something like one Marcel and you do two I on it, you'll get a one. And yeah. if you use integer, that would give you an error as well. Yeah, it's kind of the difference between time parse and date parse, right? So date parse is a lot more forgiving. One of them is more forgiving, but they're both retarded because if you do Marcel Molina, uh, date parse Marcel Molina, it gives you some date, clearly. I mean, it's not my birthday, so it's wrong. <laughs> So ultimately, the lesson is the controller shouldn't care how that is co coerced. It looks as though all that looks as though all that stuff is setting up the view. Actually, that's all data that's supposed to go to the view. It's not for finding the communities. It's setting up paging, which you should well, this probably use that stuff up there. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it go. does depend on the limit. So right. it, it, you can't. Quite it was there a second ago. They had they were finding a total and they were finding what page and what the offset is and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, yeah. If, if, total if, if this really that. is just about pagination, you'd it, start wondering like, why aren't you refactoring right. this out into a library so that it, ends up handling it in and of yeah. yeah. So it should should be put somewhere, probably not down in the Git communities because they don't care about that down in there. Right. The they, pagination is beyond that scope. Yeah, so you want to wrap Git communities in a separate method that yeah, returns something. the communities paginated. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Um, okay. You wanted to see the list here. Yeah. Well, let's just do a find with um, TextMate so that we can jump to them directly. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. You're a power user. Um, and I'm not, obviously. No, uh, command oh, shift I did the wrong F. One, didn't I? <coughs> I think we should just go in this order because we're not going to be able to locate. Sure. Yeah, so just a side note. <clears throat> doing this helper and model stuff was an old way of doing dependency loading, and all this stuff is obsolete now because it's just done automatically. For a certain time, you had to still use model user and declare a model if you wanted to store instances of that model in the session. Whether or not you should even do that is a different issue. I'm of the opinion that you should just be storing IDs and grabbing them when you need them. Um, but you don't need to use either helper or model. That's just a small detail about Rails that uh, is obsolete. Yeah, this is going to bite me now. There we go. Yeah. OK, this one, um, this is a method in the application controller, um, <coughs> protected. They do that. Um, and it basically takes a file name and an image destination and does a bunch of image magic stuff on it to crop it. Um, it really should belong in, a, in an object, in a helper object in the lib directory because it, it's beyond the scope of the controller. The controller shouldn't care how to crop an image. It, it should belong to an image cropper or an image manipulator class that, that does that. And then um, anytime you need it, you would just say image cropper dot crop image and give you the parameters. There you go. Yeah, the other thing about this is to plug Ken Beck's book again, he talks about method objects. So right, when you have this big, um, when you have this big method that sets a lot of local variables, um, it's sort of starting to look like, <coughs> hey, there's some state here that you need. If, if this was split up again, if this was split across multiple methods, some of which were private, it would be even more reason to do this. But um, Conceptually, this isn't too complicated, but it would be far nicer to read if each little subsection of it was broken off into a more symbolically representative method that was intention revealing. So the ultimate API of invoking it would just be some class method, right? Like um, image cropper dot crop arguments. Um, but the implementation would be nice, nice small focused methods that had state and didn't need to pass around locals and stuff like that. So it would simplify the implementation um, as well as separating it out into the appropriate place. Just adding quickly, there's also a number of plugins that do cropping and stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Um, since we're talking about the symbolic, since Marcel brought that up. Sure. Since Marcel brought up the symbolic aspect of, you know, of bringing methods, you know, making them more symbolic, more representative of what they're supposed to do, this is another place we, we noticed um, where he's saying if 
if params finish, if params feeds. Um, reading that code, our first thought was, well, what does that mean? What, is, what does params finish mean? What does params feeds mean? Um, it, it's a lot clearer. Like if that's saying, if something's finished, then you could have a method, you know, if something is finished, question mark. You know, and then you, you down somewhere else, you would then wrap params finish inside of that so that the code reads a lot more cleanly and you can tell the intention by looking at it. I mean, in this case, they're just checking the value of a parameter. So if the parameter is named well, then it might give you 80% of where you want to be. But thinking about problems in that more symbolic way in general will be more applicable in situations that aren't as clear cut as that. Basically, if everyone was here for Ayer's talk yesterday, the part where he had that code about like reaping zombies or whatever, that was, I think that's what you should ultimately aim for. To me, that's like a great little snippet of archetypal idiomatic Ruby, where it's basically all symbolic representations. <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant. I loved that. <laughs> yeah. Phil Morgan reap zombies. But the, it wasn't just that. I mean, the whole thing was like that. Yeah. I mean, Ruby makes it so easy for your code to read like English. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to go too far. Apple Script, I think, is the uh, the wrong way yeah. to go that far. But. And there's and there's a certain feeling you get in your tummy, like ah, oh, this is too much indirection. It's not worth it. <laughs> but most of the time, at least one level of symbolics is nice because you also just sort of have it tucked away. I mean, you can also take the approach as well. I, this is easy enough to read. I don't need a symbolic representation of it. But then the implementation gets a little bit trickier because you're adding another condition onto it. So at first it was just params whatever, but then it becomes params whatever and some other thing. And then at that point, after a certain point, your brain has to parse these implementation details and it's no longer thinking of what they actually represent. Question? Um, I noticed you guys use the ors, the double or and the double ampersand a lot. Um, do you have a thing against and and or? Well, the binding is different. Yeah. So if I do foo and a and d something else, the result of that expression is going to be the the object that was Boolean true. So like if foo is a string Marcel, it's not going to return true. It's going to return Marcel. Whereas ampersand ampersand is going to return the Boolean value of the result of that expression. And a lot of times you'll have these weird masks shadowed. I mean, you'll have these weird bugs shadowed because you're using and rather than ampersand ampersand. And so, although as a literature major, I like and because of the way it reads, <laughs> I never use it because it's not worth it. So, but Except for like when the thing Arrow was you doing. You could where, avoid it by using parentheses, right? You avoid but that's so much uglier yeah, okay. than using. All right. That's nasty. Okay. So yeah. I just was curious about your preference. Thing. I mean, sometimes it doesn't matter. Like in Arrow's example where it was in a block, you know, the, the binding of that operator, the precedence of the operator isn't going to matter in that case. But especially in when you're dealing with assignment or something or return. Like if you say return hello and this, that's not going to do what you expect. And it's this might be something with side effects where you don't actually care about the value, like redirect to or something. Yeah. So in general, I'd recommend avoiding the and word and using the ampersand ampersand. Just it's more predictable. There's a question up there. If you have a bunch of nested if statements, um, you're almost inherently not object oriented. Yeah, that's a, a bunch of if. Like, else if to me is a smell. Nested if statements is a smell. Like, you're not using polymorphism or whatever. Right, so you want to capture anything that you can in the structure of the objects around it rather than building procedural code to capture all the if statements and so forth. Yeah, right. I. I try, like, I never feel comfortable, almost never do else ifs. Almost never. Let's go back to the little find thing, unless you have something queued up. Mm -mm. Just, I would go to idiomatic Ruby. Yeah, I think we covered that one. Ah, that was okay. that. We can do this past params tab thing. Yeah, oh, we did that too. <laughs> okay. There's this, we can talk about that. Ah, okay. This, this is back to that else if thing we were just, just talking about, in fact. Um, there's this thing in here where they set a flag, has errors to false, and then they check to see if there's already a community with the given title. And if there is, they set has errors to true and set some message that they're going to display in the view. 
Um, otherwise, they check to see, okay, is there a community by that name? If there is, they set the message and the set has errors true. And then they come down and say, if it's a post, so they're doing post back, and there's no errors, then do something. Um, anytime you're, you're dealing with Booleans and error handling, you really ought to step back and think about how you could use exceptions to do it. Um, in other words, you'd throw all this into some sanity checking method or, or even into the community object itself. But yeah, there's clearly rules here that are being stated with these multiple conditions, and there's different, and so ultimately there's this higher level concept that's being hidden by procedural implementation details. Um, and so really it should be the responsibility of the higher level operation to raise the appropriate exception. And so rather than storing this state that's uh, determining whether or not you're in an error state or not, you would just be raising and rescuing that in the controller. Yeah. So then down at the bottom of the controller, you just have rescue community error. Um, you, you define some custom exception that you're going to raise so that you don't wind up catching exceptions that you didn't mean to catch. Something. And then down here, you would do your render whatever um, with the message from the exception that you want to render. It just... You don't have to worry about um, the else if stuff anymore because it's all it's all encapsulated in the in the model. Um, you're you're making your actions shorter, um, skinnier, and you're you're moving all that logic to the model. So yeah, in general, it, and Jameis wrote a whole article about this on his blog. In general, what the, the style of organizing Rails applications that's really enjoyable for me is that you know I like designing the models. I like thinking about the behavior and the business rules and the, and the entities inside of your domain and modeling all that stuff. And by modeling, I mean writing code, not like <laughs> playing with UML. Um, and what, it's really gratifying to spend time in that and create really nice, rich models. And then, and then because of that, the controllers become so dumb that they're, only, they're, they're not even interesting. They're just gratifying because of how little code you've written, right? So in... For me, controller actions should be like five lines at most. And they'll just be very declarative. They'll almost be like a DSL because the model has encapsulated all this stuff. Um, and you shouldn't be really having to be jibber-jabbering with all these different conditions inside of the controller. The controller is just saying like, um, say you're writing a chat web chat application. Um, you'll say uh, like, Banish user if not allowed, uh, and then after that, um, user enter room. And you just have these higher level objects, and you're just declaring what they're doing rather than um, having to parse what methods are being called on certain data structures and then infer what that could actually mean. We were working in a development shop, and it was a fairly large Rails application. We were all foreign to Rails. We were all just, it was a learning process to us. <coughs> the first prototype was built, and all the logic was thrown into the controller. And, you know, immediately in my head, I went, well, wait a minute. We can't reuse any of this when we want to extend it to an API because it's put into the, log into the controller. And so the light that came into my head was the immediate knowledge of, wow, we really need to throw as much of this reusable code into the model that it relates to and then build out what it could extend to in the library. And when we started realizing that, that's exactly what happened, is, is the controller became skinny, dumb, and then reusing the code was very simplistic. There's the reusable piece, which is a really valid motivation, but there's also the testing piece, where yeah. if you have all these concerns inside of your controller, you end up writing these huge, <laughs> fat, functional tests. Um, and They're really brittle. Yeah, they're really brittle. and and you'd have a lot more value if that stuff was broken up more nicely into um, the unit test. But also there's just sort of the cohesiveness of design. Uh, it just ends up being clearer what's going on when the controller is really just controlling stuff at a higher level. There's a question at the back. Spans a uh, couple of uh, models. You know, it's incorporating uh, um, information from a couple different models. Don't don't be afraid to create a model that doesn't descend from Active Record. 
Um, we've, we've done that in uh, 37 Signals for some things. We'll have a sign-up controller that encapsulates the account and the, the user and the person record and all these things. And it's just this kind of supermodel. Supermodel. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's this, it's this, and uh, ironically, it, it's very beautiful, just like a supermodel. Um, <laughs> but it, it's great at, at encapsulating those, that, that business logic that spans, spans, action, uh, spans models. And you said that's a controller or a model? You, you called model. it a controller when you first it's said a, it. It's, it's a it's class. A, it's a class. But it's okay. a model class, but it's a model that doesn't inherit from active record. So let me just show, this is one, this is an example of a skinny controller in this, the default controller. I mean, some of these actions have zero lines, you know. It's great. Right. Now, this isn't skinny because the models are, are helping. It's skinny because of other reasons. But this is, how, this is what I like a controller to look like. One note, if you look at the implementation of action controller, there's like a process method, which really just wraps the, the bulk of the request response loop. Um, and if you look at it, the part where it um, does implicit rendering, you'll see that there's a condition that says, uh, this isn't a method missing, I think. If the controller doesn't have an action by the name that we're uh, requesting, but there's a view that has that name, just render the view. So as a result, if you don't need to do any kind of controlling, if all that stuff is set up in a before filter or whatever, um, you don't actually need def about or any of these empty actions. Um, but what I would recommend, initially I would just leave them out if I just had a view. But from a sort of maintainability point of view, it's, it's nice to have all of your actions be listed there even if they're doing nothing. So what I've gone, what I've taken to do, what I have, what I do now, is I just do that. Just sort of self-documenting. That's a small tip that I'd recommend. And it's nice, too, because if later you decide you need more functionality there, you know exactly where it needs to go. You don't need to remember what the action was called and, and try and remember how to hook it up. Question back here. And, and, and wouldn't you also need to have the method if you wanted to do authentication checking uh, on that, on that uh, method? So if you didn't oh. have the method, then your before filters, there wouldn't be any filters firing... Yeah, they fire. Whether the, whether the method exists or not, before filters will always fire up until then at the time it goes, okay, I've done all these before filters, now where's the action? If it can't find it, then it tries to find a view, and if it, yeah. if it finds the view, it just renders Because that stuff's all controlled by the action name method, not by the execution of the action. Yeah. It's not doing, like, reflection. Um, action controller is actually pretty fun to dig through. It's a, it's a fun one to... to as opposed to. to action view. <laughs> right on. Let's okay. Go, let's go back to the... Oh. The question was, um, the exist method I mocked out there quick, I used a bang instead of a question mark on the end. Yeah, uh, and his question was, is that because it raises an exception? Is that my little convention? That's kind of what I've done. Anytime it, it might raise an exception, I'll do a bang on it. Because it's not one I'm saying, does this exist? Yeah, I mean, I'm saying, this exists. This exists or else kind of thing. Or actually, I'm saying it doesn't exist or else. So maybe I, I misnamed it. But anyway, the, the point of it is um, if it's a query, like if it's supposed to return a Boolean, then the question mark makes sense. But in this case, it, I didn't want it to be used that way, so I indicated that with a bang. That's just my convention. That's not necessarily a Rails or a Ruby convention, but it makes sense for me. Uh, quick question here. Do you have any advice for how to um, improve the flexibility of uh, functional tests? Ah, we have an example from this code. Well, it's actually a unit test, but it applies to both. Um, what was that? It's in the feed test. <clears throat> Down the bottom, or the whole thing, really. So there's this notion of fixtures and rails where you set up testing data, and you'll end up, it's basically a hash, right? So you have a, a label for the testing data which describes what purpose it serves, what testing scenario it's applied to, and then you have the data, the testing data. Um, all that stuff ends up being data in your database stored. And as part of your testing data, you're setting IDs on all this stuff. So um, here, where they're doing like feed find for, feed find, um, higher up it does feed find, or get feeds one, and here find four. What the hell does four mean? in this situation. What does one mean? Um, the, the appropriate way to do this 
or excuse me, a, a better way to do this <laughs> is, um, whoa. Is this a model or a, a functional, I mean a unit or a functional test? This is a unit test, but accessing stuff from your model happens just the same in functional tests. Or if you're passing an ID, like in a functional test, you would do, yeah, do like a get request for a functional test with an ID. Um. Yeah. So you could put four there, or you could do the symbolic name that describes the data that you're testing. So this is a way to make your test far less brittle because you might need to actually change what the ID is of that record and it won't affect your test, but it'll also make it um, easier to read and more maintainable for others and yourself. But it's, it's just an extension of the strive for symbolics rather than implementation details. And another thing, I mean, the striving for symbolics, if you find yourself testing this a lot, get hello with a particular ID or get hello with something, pull that into a helper method for your, for your tests. Or you a know. custom assertion. Or a custom assertion. Marcel's the, the, the king of that. The cost of wrapping that stuff into a more, a richer method is so low, and the benefits are multivalent. I don't know what they are. Okay, something like that. I mean, you can, it's easy to make your own assertions. So uh, uh, another quick question um, with the exception handling. This voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> there there is. You, you wrote the exist bang. Are you recommending doing that over the, the default active record validations? Validations are fine, but this wasn't about, well, I guess it was. It was validating the uniqueness of a couple. Um, yeah, in that case, you might want to take a look, you know, validates uniqueness of something like that, and then, and then save, yeah. Um, in fact, along with the bang idea, I use save bang a lot more than I use just save, because save bang will raise an exception if the validations fail, and then in your, your action, you just rescue active record, um, record invalid, or whatever it's called, and render your, your exception case right there, so. And, and what's the advantage of doing no, that over just false. checking whether save succeeded or not? Well, then you've got an if <laughs> statement, and we've already said those are evil. Oh. <laughs> Let's look at this, um, wait. The params thing for the helper and the block help. Yeah, tabs and block helper. Okay. Is there a valid bang? There's not. Well, when you do save bang, the Im it's implicitly a valid bang, right? So, so you're saying rescue is better looking than if. Is that what you're saying? No, not if, but like if else, if else. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So if you're saying if this is valid, do something else, do something, yeah. that gives me shivers. Okay. It's better to do if you know, food up, save, bang and then proceed with the assumption that it worked, and then have a rescue clause down at the end somewhere. Okay. In my humble opinion. Okay, what are we looking for again? <laughs> the tabs. Yeah. Somewhere. Index is where it is. It should be linked to tab. Ah, uh, yes. There it is. So there's several issues here. Um, the part we're looking at here is the current tab thing. So, um, so you're, you need to set the class if it's the current tab, and you also need it to link to a certain place, and you need a label. Um, really, a nice API for this instead would be So if you just use a couple simple conventions, which aren't too life jackety, and, or not life straight jackety, um, <laughs> then you can get all this stuff for free and have a much clearer, nicer API. The benefits, too, is that in looking around in the code, it turns out that this exact same thing is used elsewhere, right? So ultimately, you would extract and generalize this stuff into a partial or a helper that would generate the appropriate tabs for you and do the current tab stuff automatically. Also, no... By, by conventions, which location in the application to go to using a named route rather than just an action name. So here they're doing link to popular action index or whatever. So by just doing tab popular, you'd be able to set the class if current tab was set, and you'd also be able to link to the appropriate named route. Um, 
So when you look at tab, you know, symbolically it's just saying tab popular. And the fact that current tab needs to be set uh, will be taken care of in the implementation of the helper because when you're thinking of tabs, it's not the paramount concern. It's just the fact that there's a tab there. Um, but also then when you look at the helper, the helper itself has a more symbolic, clearer representation because it has named routes and you could even encapsulate the current tab stuff into something a little more elegant so that you're not depending on some, you're not coupling yourself to some instance variable, for example. Um, but you know, once you start having those tab things, and then in another place you also have those tab things, you're duplicating yourself um, so you could wrap that into a partial and it'd be even clearer. But you know, when you just have tab, if you decide it's not worth the indirection of putting it into a partial, then the duplication is at least minimized to tab whatever, tab whatever else. So anyway, by throwing that stuff into a tab helper, you're sort of fixing three problems um, and ultimately making it easier to read. Worry about that when it becomes an issue. Don't don't try and code for it just in case. Seriously, that's that's the road to madness. He was saying like the problem with taking this approach is that you're then having this coupling between the label and the location in the application. If you have any logic related to what tab you're on, and you're using the label basically, the name here is what the user sees. You know, or if you do any international work at all where you have multiple languages, yeah. you have to have you know, the, the code value of that tab and the label of that well, tab. Well, but then at that point, you know, when it comes to, so you start off with this sort of naive, simple implementation and it works, and then your boss or whoever, yourself, your conscious says, oh, this needs to happen, oh crap. Now you have this fundamentally better refactored helper that you'll then change the implementation of rather than changing the inline logic in the view anyway. So, I mean, sure, this might not be the be-all, end-all, but it's a more flexible, flexible starting point as those kinds of issues come up. In fact, you actually give a, a it's not a challenge, it's, a, it's an incentive to refactor this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. no, I agree, with, I agree with the refactoring. I'm just talking about your example. Well, he's just sort of writing it. Right? Yeah, I'm just saying, here's because th this is a pattern that's very, 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 very useful, and it demonstrates the power of named routes in particular. So I just wanted to whip something out that showed you how something like that works and how, how incredibly simple it can be to do. And you're right. There may become times where the name is not sufficient to identify the rest of the information. <coughs> when that time comes, add more information to your tab helper. Pass a few more parameters in. Let's find the edit. But in general, the fewer parameters you can give it forces you to live with more conventions. And as we've seen from Rails, rail, uh, conventions can make your life a lot easier. So the more you can depend on conventions, the better. Uh, sorry, I'll let, I'm going to actually mention something about you anyway, but then I'll let you ask your question. Another nice thing about conventions is that, so yesterday I was talking to Aaron, and we were talking about OCaml, and I was trying to convince him to get into Haskell instead of OCaml. But he was talking about how he'll be having, he'll see code where people are writing recursive functions that themselves define functions which are recursive, stuff like that. Um, so like a recursive currying function which generates, or anyway, um, and he says, you know, that stuff blows my mind. I can't conceptualize it. You know, it's paraphrasing. Um, and I was saying, yeah, but, you know, I bet the people who are writing those aren't trying to envision all of the stuff that you're trying to envision in your head because they automatically know, like, well, there's the base case in this recursive function, and there's just these automatic, like, neural shortcuts, right? So that's, in a less sophisticated sense, one of the great benefits of conventions is that conceptually... There's all this brain space that knows all of this sophisticated stuff automatically that you don't even have to bring up into the front, the foreground, um, because it'll just, using these conventions, be implicit across your domain. So in any, any event, um, the conceptual complexity, you don't have to retain as much when you sort of know that things work in a certain way by convention. That's clear. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and that, so that's... That, so that the API doesn't change an old... Yeah. As opposed to changing the number of parameters, because then i got to go back and change all the data. I think that's a really good approach in general. What he said is, in a situation like this, when I know that there's a really high likelihood that this um, method is going to be responsible for more things down the line, um, I'll just... He, he said I'll throw in an options hash, even if I'm not using it yet, and just, like, merge it on or whatever with some defaults. Um, 
because that makes it a lot easier to refactor it and enhance the behavior. And that's a general lesson that, that in the Rails API in general we've learned to do. Um, but yeah, so I would say, you know, like there's this impulse to, um, when you're implementing something, say, well, I don't really need this right now, but um, I'm just going to write something now because if I do need it later, I can have it. And so part of you says, no, shut up, just do that later if you really need to. But I think this is a case where if you're balancing, you know, whether or not it's worth it, it's so cheap to just say last argument options empty hash, um, and it makes it way easier to refactor. So this is basically like our poor man's way of doing keyword arguments, which we don't have yet. Um, and when it's in the language, we'll get that for free. But that's a good point. So then I wanted to ask you what, I, it's, it's really a philosophical question, but this thing that you're handling right here is, it's the part that makes me sick about Rails when I'm working it, with it, which is not much, but, <laughs> so, which is the whole ERB <coughs> bag. And what, the problem that I have is that, <coughs> I was just talking to Dan about this, is that when you're in the view and you're in ERB and you're mixing in Ruby, I feel like I've opened the door into Perl which is to say you can write very beautiful Perl, but it takes some programmer discipline, which is exactly what you guys are showing here. So you're show I mean, you can factor these things out. But then, and I'm just asking for your opinion on this and your experience. Um, so the question, though, becomes then, how far do you push this idiom up? In other words, why not have your view be the page, where the page is a helper. They call helpers, they call helpers, they call helpers. It's like... And, and so it's just a philosophical thing. Well, yeah, I mean, this kind of stuff is being, uh, the, the you know, sort of feeling out the limits of how far you should push this stuff out is becoming more and more of a question. Just personal experience. So I think, like, one of the ways where this, this kind of issue is being mitigated and people are experimenting is with the notion of, like, presenter patterns, where, you know, when you have, like, a somewhat sophisticated thing where you'll end up refactoring it to helpers, but then you have seven helpers that are interrelated, and it's really an object that you want to be able to encapsulate more um, and organize in and of itself and not mix it in with these other view concerns, which, um, so yeah, at a certain point, you end up refactoring it even further and pushing it into custom view classes, which are responsible for, you know, getting past a certain amount of data and then knowing how to represent some of that data. So it ends up sort of being kind of model -y, but it's this intermediary object that's, that's receiving, being composed of um, the model objects and knowing how to present them and also having access to the template to be able to do the presentation rather than being behavior on the model itself. But is that sort of addressing what you're talking about, pushing it into further layers of abstraction? Yeah, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering how, I mean, you know, you could keep pushing this page farther and farther up into helpers until it was nothing but one word. And it's just where, you know, just in your experience, it's obviously a personal thing, but it's this is the finesse that you need to keep your views from looking like, you know, ASP. And that's what, and that's what the presenters end up sort of doing. You'll be like, person.form or whatever. Right. Um, and it's really, or like person.show form, and show is really just um, uh, proxying through a presenter or delegating to a presenter. Um, so are you saying that um, if you do have like a number of helpers that you think are interrelated and you're starting to think what is the next level, the presenter is probably the way to go there? Well, Jameis has been playing around with one sort of way of implementing presenters, and I've been playing around with another way of implementing it, and I think he was excited about it and has since become less excited about it because of, you know, actually trying to use it and some of the limits of using it. Um, but there's an approach that I take which can be, you know, it's really lightweight and simple, which is basically just to create a class um, which has some set of... Um, some set of uh, model objects and then the template object. And then it just has a method missing that says if the template responds to this, invoke it on the template. So then um, you can essentially create a, a, a method object where you have the state and you can end up doing whatever view stuff you want because you have the access to the template. Um, and even if that's not built into Rails, the cost of implementing a class that just has a certain set of minimal contracts is really low and it pushes specific encapsulated concerns into their own presentation classes. So it's some pretty low cost way of cleaning up more sophisticated sets of helpers. And the extraction to do that is simple. You know, at first you're like, okay, I don't need a class, that's over-engineered, I'm just gonna write a couple helpers, and you realize you're passing data across all these helpers, and you need to add like a section of comments that will say, this is the helpers for this, so that you can visually recognize where they are, and then it's like, okay, this is a class. 
Thanks. I want to do one, wanted to show one more thing because we're kind of out of time. It's the block helper thing. The editable. Oh, yeah. Where was that? That was yeah. right there. <coughs> no. Probably not. Not that. <laughs> I think it's further down in here. Is it in this one? There it is. No, is that it? No. Oh, up here. Ah, if can edit. <clears throat> so this is sort of weird. You don't want to be setting instance variables in the controller that are magic flags and, and coupling yourself to that. Um, I think a nice pattern in this case is you know, basically, one of the the the, I, the approaches to when do I extract to a helper is um, you have conditional presentation logic, so it's a con some condition that you want to encapsulate, like if logged in question mark rather than if at sign user dot not nil or whatever. Um, so conditional presentation logic or repeated markup generation, right? Um, but in a kind of elegant way, I think of encapsulating conditional presentation logic is you can build something called a block helper where um, in the same way that form four, if you all are using the new form four, you'll just say it's not uh, ERB equals form four, so it's not spitting it out. It's just form four do, so you're yielding to a block and then stuff happening inside that block as a side effect is building, is adding stuff into the view. Um, so you can encapsulate stuff like if can edit into a more abstract conditional block helper called editable. And so what the actual code would look like here is, oh, he just had it. Show him the editable, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Right, so instead of if can edit, you would just do editable do. Um, and let's do, let's implement that. You, you implement it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does a lot of things. Um, but I'm still a Vim user at heart. Right. So state of the world is some condition can become arbitrarily complex. Um, but if it's false, this doesn't do anything, right? And so, so when you start doing if can edit and some other instance variable that I set and some other instance variable that I set, A, that's harder to parse in terms of the symbolics of what it means. Um, but B, uh, it also ends up being something you use all over the place and you'll have to start duplicating all that stuff. And so you could wrap that inside of some method like if something, um, if some predicate view stuff else uh, or whatever, but it's nice to just have the API of doing uh, like admin content do. And so you're basically just saying stuff inside of this block is admin content and whether or not to actually display it um, is, this is the right, this is the reason why this is nice. It's not just a matter of wrapping an if implicitly. It's not just a matter of a different way of doing a condition. It means you can also do like pre and post processing. So in the case that it's true, you can just, you can also do, I always want to have this wrapped in a div. Um, so every time you have an admin section, you're going to put the content that you want there if the current user is an admin, but you also want to have a policy that that content is always wrapped in a, in a div with a certain class and whatever other arbitrarily sophisticated thing you want to do, which you don't want to have to include every time you're specifying admin content. You get what I mean? Collective yes. All right. So this little this block helper pattern is nice, both for wrapping conditionals, but also just for doing any kind of. Um, it's sort of like you know just getting the yielding to a block thing where it does pre and post processing, but applying that to a view context. Aira. Concat is just a shorthand for doing underscore erb out and then concatting it onto this thing. Because the way, like, if, do we have a, if you go to some template and do, what is it, ERB hyphen X? Chad, what is it? You can't just. You, you couldn't call it with block. 
block or and block right there? You both have to call it and pass the binding. It seems like you could just pass the block. Oh. The binding is needed in order to get the ERB out variable. But he's just saying you should just be able to pass the block. Oh, so we could that. we could implement concat so that if it just had a block. Yeah, that would be better. Okay. That, but that's that's our problem, not your problem. Yeah. Era is saying you should just be able to do something like this and and have it automatically know do what call to do and binding. Problem. Yeah. So this is like a Rails issue, not a client. It's like an internals rather. Or that. I mean, that's probably. So that label. would be nicer. Good call, Era. But for people who are just interested, we can look at what an you can just get an yeah. RHTML template and do ERB hyphen X and Here. on the command line. On the command line. You would ask for the command line. <coughs> okay. App views or whatever. Um, Community index. That's right. So is it this? ERB hyphen X. So ERB is like a hack to the max. Um, it just has this magic underscore thing that you call concat on, and then it just ends up sticking all the string on, on it, and then it evals it. That's how it's just an evaling templating system. Um, so our concat is just a like slightly friendlier wrapper around underscore ERB. <laughs> but it's like, it's so it's a way of, um, it's like a side effect where you're actually modifying the template. Yeah. I think we're out of time. That's it. Thank you guys. Thanks.